Pebble Beach, are we ready? Sing a little louder, louder 
Let's um, just bow your heads, close your eyes. You guys just keep playing. A um, couple things I want to tell you uh, that uh, Dan Russell will be at the Connect Center for the Intimate Marriage Seminar, seminar and Pat will be there for the Foundations uh, class that takes place on Sunday, tell you what that's about, what's that about and how you can get involved in that. 
And I just want to uh, encourage us as we continue to worship and sense the presence of God here tonight. Um, again, I'm just going to ask you to, if you've got a prayer in your heart, keep it short and to the point. Pray out loud, and then I'll close us in prayer, and we'll go right back into worship. Um, the ushers will come and receive this evening's tithes and offering, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, here we are, your church. <clears throat> And we've come with uh, things that you've placed on our heart that we want to lift up, Father. Mm. Yes, God. Yes, God, heal him. Father, have your way here tonight with us. Uh, move and, and uh, do the things you want to do in each one of our lives, but then collectively as a group, Father, as we continue to lift our voices in worship and praise, that, God, you would receive it, Lord. You'd be pleased. And that, Lord, tonight, just as a church, would you strengthen us all? Um, there, there are so many, both here and online and out in the parking lot. God, would you do something remarkable in our lives tonight that we would be able to go home and say wow we were in the house of the Lord and, and we met and felt the presence of a living God so God we ask you to do that even tonight heartaches and pains that exist in this room tonight Lord speak peace to them and and for physical ailments God heal speak healing tonight um, we are so grateful for your love as we continue to worship if you would like to keep standing you can you can sit down um, but feel free to worship God however God uh, puts it on your heart too. Without you, 
I fall apart Cause you're the one guides my heart Come on, you sing it. Cause Lord, I need you Oh Sin runs deep. Your grace is more. Your grace is found. It's where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ. For and powerless, and all the lost and lonely, all the thieves will come confess, and we'll know that you are holy. Yeah, we'll know. And Lord, we'll 
Let me have a seat. Thank you, Jeff. You just explained to us what happens when the Holy Spirit meets coffee. <laughs> I saw that big old coffee you got on the way in here. I'm like, man, he gets up there and he gets all anointed and starts singing. It's going to be over. Uh, <laughs> come on, Tommy. You know it's true, bro. You know, you worship set, pound a couple espressos. Whoa, the Spirit's moving. It's awesome. It's awesome. Awesome to have a space in our week to come, huh? And just belt out our praise to our Father. Just declare what we know is true. To use the sound of our voice to speak out the goodness of our Heavenly Father. Regardless of what the news is telling us today. Regardless of what culture is telling us today. Or all the next things that people are texting you or sharing on social media. It's good to just have a space to kind of come in and focus on what really matters. And that's our relationship to Jesus Christ. That, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That's been my thing all week this week. I shared that. It's a quote from John Piper this weekend. It just keeps coming back to me. Matt, God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. It's nothing about the things I think I need to be doing for him. It has nothing to do with the right stickers on my car, the right t-shirts on my body. It has nothing to do with the, me even saying all the right words or doing all the right things. But it has everything to do with me finding my satisfaction in God. And that's such a profound statement that he is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. So the cry of my heart is, Lord, how can I be most satisfied in you? Because each and every day I find so many things that bring quick satisfaction that I want to occupy my time or my feeling with. How can I use that time for more of you? How can I have a greater sense and depth connection where my soul is connected to your Holy Spirit? That I can be so deeply satisfied in you, I'm not affected by what's happening around me. I'm not affected by what's spinning around me, what people are calling or texting or I'm seeing in social media. It doesn't affect me because I already have my satisfaction. And it's nothing that I've built with my own hands, but it's been a gift that's been put in my hands, which is Jesus Christ. And he is that deep satisfaction for all of us. And I can only say that probably now because I've been on the earth long enough to realize I've tried a lot of other things and they really didn't satisfy me for very long. <laughs> Even the act of having children seems super satisfying until they act up. But, um, <laughs> you know, you think having a family, that's it. If I could just have a family. It, there's nothing more satisfying than having Jesus consume you. And, and his heart for us is that we would find that deep satisfaction in him. His heart isn't looking for you to do things with your hands. His heart is wanting to connect to your heart. That you would find that deep sense of value and love and acceptance and forgiveness and well-being um, in him. And while that seems like a very New Testament concept, it really isn't. Because as we'll see tonight, there is one person that the Old Testament talks a lot about that really grasped that, and that was King David. And we know that because of his writings in the Psalms. The guy wrote over 70 Psalms. Uh, if you didn't know, we've been reading through the Bible this year together. I know for many of us, it's probably been a bit laborious through Easter because there's so many Easter things happening. We might have lost our way. It's okay. Just get back in your app. Just skip those days and start where we are. Uh, you're actually going to find we're already into 2 Kings. Is kind of where we should be tonight. But of course, I'm not going to go into talking about First and Second Kings because we kind of skipped over some really meaningful stories and people. And so I kind of want to zone in, in particular, focus in on King David a little bit. Because I think there's something sweet about how God worked in King David's life that I think is really applicable for us today. And so while... There's a lot to cover in 1 and 2 Kings. All I'll say is this. It covers about 380 years of Israel's history, and all the prophets fit in somewhere in the timeline of the kings. That's it. We're done. We covered two whole books of the Bible. Uh, what I want to do is instead I'd rather focus on 1 and 2 Samuel a little bit because we missed that. But in missing that, we missed kind of um, the heartbeat of the Old Testament, which is around this guy named David, this King David. Because uh, in many ways, Jesus was fulfilling a lot of what King David did, but more so what King David couldn't do. And King David is probably the most um, written about in the historical narratives of the Old Testament man that we have. Uh, he's kind of like the Jesus of the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus obviously has four Gospels recording his life stories, uh, along with different um, peppering in the book of Acts and the rest. But um, outside of Jesus, David would be next. As far as like a robust story of a man 
in his interaction with Yahweh. And so we have that in David. And I think it's in particular in there because for the Jewish people, he is basically their icon. In many ways, they're hoping for another king like King David to come again for their nation and rule them and set them up and allow them to have their full land. So to the Jewish people, the King David is like an icon to them. He is um, someone that God worked mightily through and did mightily things in Israel's history. Uh, and in many ways, he's the king that no other king ever really measured up to. Uh, of course, in many ways, he was... Um, a type of Christ in some respects. He wasn't Christ, but he was pointing to a greater king, uh, and that being Jesus Christ. But of course, we know most Jewish people don't believe in Jesus as being that messianic king. But, but one thing we can agree with Jewish people on is that uh, David was a special guy. And that in one thing that kept him special more than anything would probably not be anything that he did with his hands, but everything he felt with his heart. Because David had this real soft heart for Yahweh. In many ways, you see in David a personal relationship with Yahweh that you don't see previously in any of the writings up until King David. Uh, it's almost like a New Testament relationship that David has with Yahweh, where many other ones didn't have that close a relationship. You know, Moses had a pretty good close relationship with God, but it was a bit more authoritarian. It was a bit uh, more reverent and worshipful. Uh, you don't hear Moses processing the inward feelings of his heart with Yahweh. But you see that with David. You see David as someone that is, in many ways, a very hyper feeler. So, so, so what I want to do tonight is, briefly, is I want to talk about a couple things about David's life. Now, in particular, around this theme of humility. Because I don't know about you, but if there's anything that I need more of in my life, it's probably humility. <laughs> uh, because I know there's one thing I need less of in my life, and that's pride. <laughs> and, and, and if you don't feel that way, then it's probably because you're prideful. But the, the, the thing, <laughs> I'm just kidding, kind of kidding, kind of not kidding. Uh, anyways, uh, the, the thing about pride is it kind of sneaks in and touches all the other sins. Uh, in many ways, pride might be the underlying current of all the sins of, that we have. Because pride is basically the idea that we're self-sufficient. That we weren't designed for anything else but ourselves and we can handle it. Therefore, then we can make any decisions we want on our own. And so pride is the beginning of a lot of the sins that we do. I can hurt that person or I can harm that person or I can um, you know, take this money or I can do this with my personal time. I can do all those things, those extracurricular sins because at the end of the day, I'm just prideful. I, I'm, I'm the master of my domain. I'm, I'm sure God designed me, but ultimately he's designed me with a brain and I, I can take care of myself. And so pride kind of sneaks in as a good sense of pride and like you would have in your son or your daughter, but then it quickly gets twisted as we become th the ones that we feel like we know best for ourselves. And then that kind of flows into a lot of different things. And if I look at the majority of any conflicts in my life, uh, usually there's pride within it, uh, in particular relational conflict. I don't know if any of you are married in here, but maybe some of you have fights in your marriage. I don't know. I have a couple from time to time. And typically, and my wife and I, when we go at it, uh, we are vocal people in our fights. And um, it gets loud up in here when we go at it. And, um, and, and it's typically, it goes there because we're not willing to be walking in any type of humility around the thing we're fighting about. We're holding on to what we want to hold on to. Even if it's completely irrational, doesn't make any sense, in the fight, we'll keep repeating our thing over and over and over again. You ever notice that in fighting, you're like a broken record player? You know, you're like, wait, we've been fighting for 30 minutes, and I've, all I've been saying is the same sentence over and over and over again. And, and then later when you make up, you realize, why did I spend all that time saying that thing over and over again? Like, I, I, I couldn't be creative and think of a different way to say it. Like, but, but you're so wrapped up in a fight, and it's usually because of your pride. Well, a little humility would go a long way, because in humility, you'd probably keep your mouth shut. Uh, you'd probably um, use the one mouth, close it, and open your two ears, meant for listening more and talking less. And so you might do that if you were walking in a bit of humility. And so in many ways, what I think, what I see in David's life is um, just a life and a heart saturated in humility. Not that he didn't do stupid things, not that he didn't make lots of mistakes, which we'll talk about. But you just see this constant thread of humility, uh, this constant, you, you know, <clears throat> my mom was visiting recently and she said, Matt, the weirdest thing about being as old as I am is when I look in the mirror. And I was like, well, why? Because <laughs> you're old? And she said, no, it's because, she said, no, it's because when I look in the mirror, I realize I'm old because I walk around still thinking I'm young. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? And in many ways, I think what David 
what you see him as a young boy, this young shepherd boy, I don't think he ever loses that, that moldable heart. I think there's, there was something in David's makeup as a man in his personality, be it he being the baby in his family, be it spending a lot of time on his own. Maybe it's because he seems to be a very strong feeler in his creative writings. Whatever it is, regardless of how old he got and how, many le- how much leadership was thrown on him and how much accomplishments were put on him, uh, he always seems to carry this same childlike sweet spirit that he had. Uh, maybe that's because he was an artist. I, I, don't know, I don't know what it is, but you can, you can see that. And you'd almost ask David, he'd probably say the same thing. I've got all this leadership, all this great stuff. When I look in the mirror, I'm shocked because in my mind, I still see myself uh, as the shepherd boy fighting the lions and protecting my father's sheep. Um, and so, and I think for all of us, we could probably say that we, as we get older, we, we carry that with us. And, and part of the, whole th- the hard thing about getting older is coming to terms with the added wrinkles in our skin and the, the inability to do certain things. And, uh, you know, I won't go any further there because then you'll start pointing things out about me. But, so King David's interesting. So to, to give you a little background on King David, first we have to kind of back all the way up because um, in many ways the Old Testament writers are writing the story of David because it's a very important link between um, God leading everything, which he was doing through Moses and then through the judges, and then man deciding to pick up their own leadership, which began with the king's stall. And so you basically have this, this shift moving from like a theocracy where um, Theos being God is the one leading to not democracy, no one voted, but, but in some form of a, a human-run government at that point. And, and that shift happens right between the books of Judges and Samuel. But right inserted in between those two books is this short four-chapter book called Ruth. And Ruth is kind of a peculiar story to be slotted in there. If you're reading the book of Judges, you're like, mind's being blown how violent it is and how crazy it is. And this cycle that the people keep getting themselves in or, or that everything seems great. And then they start worshiping other gods and the nations. Those nations come in and begin to oppress them. They get oppressed. They cry out to God. God's spirit rests on someone like a Gideon or a Samson. All of a sudden they rise up, set Israel free. They find peace again. And then eventually they start worshiping other gods again. It's this constant cycle. And this cycle is eventually broken with the story of Ruth. And Ruth is a fascinating woman in the story, in particular, of the line of Judah, and in particular, the story of David's life. Because if you don't know much about culture at that time, uh, women found their value in being married. And in particular, not just being married, bearing children. And then, to be more specific, bearing male children. Uh, Outside of that, a woman's value was probably determined by the family and by the men that were around her. Uh, and basically what you happen is have what you see is this woman named Naomi whose husband dies and the two sons that she has, they also die. And she's stuck as a woman with her two daughter-in-laws going, what hope is there for us? Like, like there's nothing for us anymore. We have no men in our lives whatsoever. My name will not continue on, in which you'll see that that's significant that it does. But that her bloodline will not continue on, and she's lost. And so she goes to one daughter-in-law and says, you should leave. Goes to the other daughter-in-law and says, you should leave. One daughter-in-law says, yes, fine, I'm going to go back to my family. The other daughter-in-law decides to stick by her, and her name is Ruth. And Ruth wasn't even a Jew. She was a Moabite. And so Ruth sticks by Naomi. Long story short, this guy named Boaz comes along, and he becomes the family redeemer, or what's called the kingsman redeemer. And a kingsman redeemer was basically an individual inside of a family or in a family line, some sorts, that would help a family continue on by taking up the widow of that family. And what their job was to do, for instance, if I, I have a brother, this is going to sound really weird. It's, I'm going to try to bring it to modern day. It's not really going to translate, but it'll help you get the idea. And say my, um, and they're not going to watch online right now because they're in New York and they're sleeping. So, and so say my brother and I were both married. Um, my brother dies. Um, I would, to be a kinsman redeemer to his family, I would go and take his wife to be one of my wives, have children with her, to do him honor to see his bloodline continue on. So, or our, or our bloodline continue on, and her finding honor in doing her part in that. And so Boaz becomes that, ironically, with a Moabite woman. She decides to become a part of the family of Israel and um, gets grafted in. And that's important because Ruth and Boaz end up becoming the great-grandparents of David. So that... If that never happens in this four chapter book of Ruth, David never ends up being born, who becomes the one that is the um, pointing towards eventually the messianic king. 
Uh, we don't have any of his writings in our books, his 70 plus psalms. We don't have his story in there. None of it's in there. So the authors put this four chapter book in there to tell the story of how eventually David came to be. Now we know that Israel wanted a king after the judges and after the time of Ruth. Ruth was kind of at the end of the time of judges. And so what they did was they went to their prophet at that time. The prophet was Samuel. And they said, we want a king. God allowed them to have a king. And Israel selected a king that they liked. It was this guy by the name of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. He looked the part. He was handsome. He was tall. He was well spoken. Um, Samuel came, anointed him as king. And he was the first king of Israel. But shortly thereafter, he began to struggle <laughs> in more ways than one. And clearly he began to find some type of torment. Clearly it was spiritually Spiritual, could even have been demonic or some form of mental illness. And he began to drift away from the Lord. And in his drifting away from God, God decided to say, you're not going to be the king anymore. I'm going to pick a different king. But there's a problem. Because Israel already picked him to be their king. And while God might have had a different plan, Israel already saw Saul as their king. Even though God decided he wanted to pick a young shepherd boy by the name of David. So... Samuel goes, okay, Lord, if you want to pick a new king, we'll do so. And he goes to the family of Jesse, and Jesse's got seven sons or eight sons, where different scholars view different ways on that. Um, Jesse invites Samuel in. Samuel says, hey, I've come. The, one of the sons approaches him at the door. He's a real attractive, strong-looking dude, seems to line up like all the parts of Israel want. He goes, oh, my gosh, this is the guy. And God says, no, that's not the king this time. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, this is what God says to Samuel. When Samuel wants to pick what the world would want as a king, God had a different idea in mind. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so Samuel's like, say what? Like, we need a strong king, like, you know, Saul was super strong, but obviously not strong enough, so don't we want a stronger king? But God's seemingly saying, listen, you guys prompted Saul to be picked as king, and I went along with what you guys wanted. This is a king that I really want for the nation of Israel. So continuing down in verse 11, then Samuel asked to Jesse, are all these the sons you have? Because he walks in and said, that guy's not it, and these other sons, they don't look like they're going to be it. Is this all that they have? They're still youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down and eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Am I continuing? No, I'm stopping there. So it's a weird scenario. David's this shepherd boy, from what we can tell, caring for a sheep. He's the youngest, probably has the least ownership in many things, and probably he's getting all the crappy work that his brothers are giving him. He's out in the fields, and he's caring for his father's sheep, and all of a sudden he gets called in, thinking maybe his brother's going to give him a noogie or rub his face in the dirt, only to see the prophet Samuel in his house. And pretty quickly, oil's being poured all over him. And he's just been anointed the king of Israel. Awkward. <laughs> and to make things even more awkward, then the spirit of the Lord descends on him. And he feels the power of God. But he's just a shepherd's kid. No one knows who he is. No one knows his name. No one's heard of him. Israel already has their king. His name is Saul. He's dealing with the Philistines and this psychotic, massive man called Goliath yelling to kill everyone all day long. And so David's got this anointing from God with an empowerment of the spirit to be the king of Israel. Yet he's a short, young kid that's got some good-looking eyes and he's kind of attractive, but that's about all he has going for him. And we begin to see David learn the understanding of trusting God's way in his life above what maybe others would want him to do. Because there's this awkward scenario that's going to go on in 1 Samuel where David has basically been chosen as the king by the heaven, his heavenly father. But Israel still sees Saul as their king. 
And he's got to trust whatever God did there. I just need to be obedient to what he does. And so what we see is this elaborate, I don't know, an elaborate display of humility through David's life for the entire T of, I would say the entirety of 1 Samuel and a good part of 2 Samuel. And when I looked at that, I thought, man, let me just highlight that a little bit this evening. I'm not going to go through this whole story. I just want to go through a couple of the stories that give us a bit of understanding of the humility that David had. And maybe it can speak a little bit into our hearts about the humility that God might want or desire us to have in our lives. And, and more importantly, what that kind of humility can do within our hearts. Goliath. We all know the story. David goes down and one of his first acts is he goes down and he slays the giant Goliath. And everyone's struck by what he did. And we look at that story and we get fired up and we're like, man, Lord, what are the Goliaths you want to take down in my life? Or more importantly, we don't really say that. We say, yeah, Lord, what are the Goliaths I want to take down in my life? What are you going to empower me to take down? What Goliaths are in my life that you want to remove? And oftentimes we get our mind fixed on what we want God to do because we read this story of this hum humble young guy that, that went and took down this Goliath and we think, man, how can God do that for me? And we begin to look and build a picture and expectation of how God should do that for us. And oftentimes, I don't know about you, I'm a little bit let down because God's not always interested in taking out the certain giants that I think he should be taking out in my life. And what's fascinating about that story is David was not going down there to take out Goliath. David was going to bring sandwiches to his brothers, and Goliath just happened to get in the way. See, David wasn't, he had no great purpose in going down there. He was probably freaking out. Did anyone hear about the anointing thing? I hope no one heard about it, because my dad wants me to bring sandwiches down to the battle line. This is going to be really weird if anyone's talked about it, because Saul's there, and I can, like, interact with him, and is he going to, like, kill me if he knows that, I, you know, like, what's going to happen here? So David wasn't even envisioning the Goliath thing. His heart was to be obedient to his father to do what? Serve his brothers. And interestingly enough, in his humility of being obedient to serve his brothers, Goliath ended up getting in the way. And God did something for him that he would have never imagined. God did something in David's life that he would have never, ever been able to fathom. But he was never focused on it until the story began to unfold. And I realized, man, how many times do I walk with too much pride in my life of what I think God should be doing? And God's just saying, Matt, just bring sandwiches to your brothers. I only have one, so it doesn't take very long. Does that make sense? Matt, just serve those around you. Matt, just, just, just use your gifts and how you're meant to use them. Just If you see a need, jump in and help. Don't, don't worry about the glass. If they get in your way, I'll be there to get them out of your way, and you'll be able to see me do something way bigger than you ever thought I'd do in your life. So many times, and, it, and it's maybe it's an entitlement feeling we have as Americans. We think we're entitled to be the biggest and the best in any part of our faith. And I think we need to get back to this just handing out some sandwiches. And maybe at the end of the day, I just need to hand out sandwiches. It's not about me. It's not about where I've come from, what I think I have to offer. Maybe, maybe I just need to focus on the sandwiches and then God will bring those Goliaths when they need to be brought up or he'll stir them up in my life when they need to be stirred up and he'll show me how great he is. But it will be much vaster than I ever would have thought possible than when I had the pride of my heart saying, I want this to be done. And I love this story because it just reminds me every day, Matt, just, just, just focus on giving people sandwiches. And God will make special whatever he wants to do in your life. Because ultimately it's about God anyways, it's not about you. I found that when I was looking through David's life, there's a couple of things that kind of stood out for me. One is that, that humility allows God to bring God-sized opportunities for him to work in your life. But also that humility gives the opportunity to win the battles that happen within our hearts. Because the interesting thing about David is that he was anointed king and then he began working for Saul, playing music to help calm his demons. And then he ended up taking up some of Saul's military. And then he began doing a really good job for the nation of Israel. And as he served, as God paved the way for him to get more involved in things, Israel began to recognize something that was very special about this guy. 
to the point that people would sing a song about him saying, Saul has killed thousands, David has killed tens of thousands. That statement actually made Saul go crazy in jealousy and envy for David. But God ended up kind of promoting David in his humble heart as he was serving. God continued to promote him. Um, and people began to see that God was obviously working on this man. I'm sure the story began to spread that he was actually anointed as king. And, and there's one in particular story that two, on two different occasions where David is caught in a conflict with Saul and has an opportunity to end his conflict with Saul. This is why. Since the moment after Goliath, as David would play his harp and calm the demons in Saul, actually the very first time the scripture tells us, as he's playing his harp to calm the demons in Saul, Saul gets enraged, jumped up, and do you know the story? He throws a spear at him. He tries to kill him. It actually says he did it twice. Now what's interesting is if you track the amount of times that Saul had an intent to kill David, when I went through scripture, I counted at minimum 12 different agendas that Saul had to try to kill David in just a matter of a few chapters. Okay? This man wanted David dead. Uh, from every way, from sending 3,000 men to try to kill him, to uh, strategizing with trying to get him out front in the army to be killed, uh, to a variety of different things, throwing spears at him and him jumping out of the way. Over 12 different times, this guy Saul desires to kill David. Yet at the opportunity that David has, in many ways, rightfully so to defend himself, rightfully so to have a sense of pride, like, I need to stay alive, this guy's trying to kill me, David does something completely countercultural to that. 1 Samuel chapter 24. After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone to the wilderness in En Gedi. So, so, so Saul chose 3,000 elite, tro elite troops from all over Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. At that place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today, the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do it as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. How did he do that? I'm not sure how he was relieving himself. Either one or two is going to be awkward. And how do you not notice someone coming and going, it must have been a violent relief. I don't know how. Anyways, I'm just reading, just telling you the story. So this is the crazy part, okay? Verse 5. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut off, cut Saul's robe. Okay. His men are saying, kill the fool. He decides to just cut his robe off. He walks back and his conscience begins bothering him because in some respect he felt that just the cutting off the robe and killing him was the same act, not physically, but an act of his heart. Because it was an act of his pride. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone his way, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord the King! And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. This is a dude that's tried to kill you over 12 times. If, if anyone had any right, it was David to take him out. After all, he was the anointed actual king of Israel by God. Yet in the, in the humility of this kid's heart, cutting a piece of his cloak felt just as bad as actually killing him. Gosh, I wish I had a heart like that. <laughs> I'm just being honest. The amount of humility that that was, like, I would have walked out of there like, man, you know what, that fool, I got that robe right here. I could have killed him. But look, Jesus loves me because I didn't. I let him walk out of here. Do you all see that? you all see that? I'm going to make a necklace out of this thing. I'm going to everyone see that I could have killed him, but I didn't because, you know, Jesus loves me and I love, you know. That's my attitude. 
But the very act of doing that was so convicting to David's heart. And I think that's why when you look at David, you look at all the messed up stuff he did do with, with Bathsheba, with the eventual sending Bathsheba's husband to the front line so he would be killed. Some of the, the just the messed up stuff he did. And you go, how does God stick by someone like that? And you go, because the guy's got a heart like this. In his heart of hearts, he understood that God, as his psalm said, was the only one that could create a clean heart inside of him. And, and we see his dependence upon him. Now what's really fascinating to me is finally at the end of 2 Samuel, the beginning of 1 Samuel, Saul actually passes away. And he's actually killed alongside of his son Jonathan, who is one of David's, who is David's best friend, which only made the relationship, so the relationship circle even more convoluted. The man that wants to kill him, his son's his best friend, just, just the whole thing's messed up. And you think at that point maybe David would like somewhat rejoice. Like finally my arch enemy, the man that's been chasing me in and out of caves, I've done nothing wrong. I've done everything to fight for Israel. I've risked my life on countless occasions to fight the Philistines. And constantly the one guy that should have my back wants to stab me in the back. I've literally almost been stabbed in the back as I've jumped out of his spears being thrown at me. And all I was trying to do is play some songs in my heart to make the guy calm down. You'd think that finally at the end of his, Saul's day, David would be like, Okay, he's dead. Let's move on and let's not talk about that again. But that's not what he does. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, let me give some context. Saul's dead. A man comes running to David to inform him of what's happened to Saul and that he's actually passed away. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6. The man answered, I happened to be in Mount Geboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear with the enemy chariots and charioteers closing in on him. When he turned and saw me, he cried out for me to come to him. How can I help, I asked him. And he responded, who are you? I'm an Amalekite, I told him. And then he begged me, come over here and put me out of my misery, for I am in terrible pain and I want to die. So I killed him, the Amalekite told David, for I knew he couldn't live. And then I took his crown and his armband and I have brought them here to you, my Lord. This is the crazy part. David and his men tore their clothes in sorrow when they heard the news. They mourned and wept and fasted all day for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the Lord's army and the nation of Israel because they had died by the sword that day. It goes on that he actually even wrote a song in tribute to Saul. His arch enemy, the man that constantly envisioned destroying David. Finally, David, in a sense, has been saved. In many sense, with the death of Saul, David's life has been spared. And he doesn't celebrate. He mourns the death of his very own enemy. And you go, what kind of man has a heart like that? And you go, man, that's the heart that God saw in King David. David did a lot of dumb stuff. And unfortunately, after David, his kids did even more dumb stuff. And you get about 380 years of lots of kings doing lots of dumb stuff. But God wasn't concerned with the dumb stuff. God was concerned with the humility in his heart. And, and God saw in David's heart something that the authors tried to capture in their writing. They tried to illustrate to us. But I think God saw something just... A, a, a desperate dependence on God, a desperate knowing of feeling that he had no worth except for, what he, except for the worth he found in God. And even though he slipped up, made some radical mistakes, it wasn't about the mistakes. It was about the state of his heart. And I realized, man, humility makes all the difference in our relationship to God. Humility makes all all the difference in our relationship to each other. Humility makes all the difference in how we interact in the world that we're placed in. Humility makes all the difference in who Christians are and maybe who Christians aren't. And we can see that David gave us a model at a time when there wasn't even talk of Jesus and grace and a sacrifice for sins in a sense, in that way, a final sacrifice for sins. They, they did have the law and the and the, and, the, and the temple and the sacrifice, sacrificial system there. But we get this beautiful picture of God's affection towards a humble heart. And it's a model for us 
to say, God, I don't have a heart like David, but I want a heart like David. So God, by your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you come in and make my heart like that of David's? Because I got some enemies in my life right now that I would be celebrating if they would die. I got some people up in my life right now that I don't want to admit they're right, and I'm not going to even after tonight. I don't got that heart, Lord, but I want that heart. I want that heart that is broken before you and is solely being satisfied by you because I want to experience you, God. And I think David gives us a picture that that happens when we walk in humility. Let's pray. Lord, I think the prayer that we all would have is, Father, I want to see you more in my life. I want to see you working more in my life. I want to experience you more in my life. For some of us, we're going, Lord, I, I, I'm learning all day. I've been reading books, but I don't feel like, I, I don't feel like I, I, I'm seeing you or feeling you around me. I think that's because, Lord, sometimes we just get too hung up on being our own boss, being our own king, in many ways being our own gods. But Holy Spirit, you come in and you make our hearts soft. You come in and you can make our hearts humble. Because that's all that God's after. <laughs> and one thing's for sure, David shows us is that it has nothing to do with winning the battle with our hands, but everything to do with winning the battle within our hearts. And Holy Spirit, you do that for us. So Holy Spirit, I ask that tonight you would just permeate the walls we've built of pride around our hearts tonight. That you, would just, that you would just supernaturally break down the things that we've built for ourselves. Because ultimately, Lord, we just want more of you. We want to experience more of you. We want to know more of you. We want to sense more of you. But we've got to let go to do that. Holy Spirit, I ask that in this evening and in this week that we would be mindful of the humility of David and go, man, that's the kind of heart I want to. And then we would be encouraged as we'd invite the Holy Spirit to make our heart that kind of heart. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the curse of His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by every stone, and Cyrus there.
He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. That's where I want to be. Uh, don't rush out of here. Hang out. Talk to some people. It's early. I just love Thursday nights. Um, thanks for coming and being part of what God's doing here online. Um, the uh, one thing I want to mention, Sue, are you going to be at the Connect Center? Talk about the men's Bible study coming up. There's, there's going to be, and Carrie, are you going to be there? Okay, so there's going to be a party at the Connect Center, you guys. So if you have questions about anything going on in the Life Park Church, go there. If you just want to talk to people, go there. Uh, but I want to let you know that we have the Inspired Exhibit coming, and uh, he's, he's got some really new stuff they found. It's going to be absolutely incredible, so look in the, online on the website of that. And then the Tough Questions seminar coming up really soon. Uh, you don't want to miss that. If you have any kind of interaction with kids, whether they're very young or teenagers, let me tell you, this is going to help equip you, give you, give you some uh, biblical foundational stuff, it's going to be very informative. You'll have a chance to ask some questions. Um, it's going to be very good. So uh, go online, read about it, uh, sign up for it. Already a lot of people have signed up. But we'd love to have all of the people involved with kids be there. It's going to be awesome. And then tonight, um, when you go away, as this message just kind of stirs in our hearts um, and finds root, may God bless you. May he strengthen you and empower you. May you go and understand that God goes before you and is behind you and lives in you and live a life with a focus on Jesus Christ. May Jesus bless you and fill you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together this last song.
mountains that I fade Stronger than the power of the rain When I'm constant in the trial and the change
great night.